Hi. If any of the following seven facts surprise you, then I'd like to suggest that you need to review your cold weather gear choices and your safety communication options. Fact one, the rate of heat loss of the human body when immersed in water compared to that of air is 25 times greater. Yes, 25 times greater. Fact two, at 13 and a half degrees water temperature, which is a frequent winter temperature here in False Bay, at 13 and a half degrees, if immersed in water without insulation, you will die of hypothermia somewhere between the passing of one and six hours. Fact number three, actually it's worse than that because you will die sooner of drowning even if wearing a sport life jacket because of the loss of large muscle control and or you're passing into the state, this phase of the stage of unconsciousness. Fact four, in the last three years, there have been two surf skier fatalities, to my knowledge, globally. Uh, and in both of those instances, the paddler died of hypothermia. Point five, we've had three surf skier rescues here in False Bay over the last six weeks. In two of those instances, the paddlers were well into stage one of hypothermia. And in one of those instances, he was already beginning to experience large muscle control loss. Point six, recently there have been at least three instances of safe tracks failure, either by being unable to make an emergency call or not, be, not being tracked, even though the paddlers had safe tracks open. And that's all been within the previ previously considered safe territory of the regular Miller's run. Point number seven, the last point, Equipment fails far more frequently than we like to believe. In my research for this video, I've spoken to two of our local paddlers who unbelievably have had two instances each of, in the one instance, paddle breakage, and in the other, paddle breakage and, and paddle loss. So join me as we explore number one, the science of hypothermia, two, cell phone reception in False Bay, three, what we can learn from these two fatalities and the three rescues, and finally, the implications for us in terms of cold weather gear and safety communications choices. Before we start out, let's put things in proper perspective. Surf skiing is not a particularly dangerous adventure sport. Compare it, for example, to my other two great loves, adventure motorbike riding and skydiving, which I did for three years in my 20s. And in those three years, I experienced five deaths with two occurring within five minutes of each other, and the second of those being hugely shocking as I both felt and heard the impact. The point of this video, however, is that in the instance of surf skiing, one can virtually eliminate the risk of death. The average body temperature is 37 degrees with a range of 36 and a half to 37 and a half. Now you'll note that stage one where one is awake and shivering has a range of 32 to 35 degrees. Stage two where one is drowsy but not shivering, classified as moderate, 28 to 32 degrees. And then in stage three, one is already unconscious, which means that somewhere in stage two, one loses the ability to hold onto one's ski and to hold one's head upright. So even if you are wearing a sport life jacket, you will drown. The table on the right shows the temperature range in False Bay, whereas the table on the left categorizes the rate at which hypothermia causes death according to three ranges of temperature. You'll note that the death zone range at the bottom of the table is quite large. It's from one to six hours. And that's because there are a number of factors that combine uniquely for each individual to determine their cold tolerance. So there's the issue of fitness. The fitter you are, the more heat you can generate. There's the percentage body fat and the manner in which it's distributed in your body. Thirdly, the very important issue of cold water conditioning. And then there's the fourth unknown physiological X factor um, in the same way that you cannot predict how someone is going to respond to high altitude oxygen uh, deprivation. One just can't predict how someone's going to respond to cold water immersion. 
I cannot claim that this next table is scientific. What I've done is as follows. Bottom left hand side 13 and a half reflects the average temperature over the last six weeks uh, in, here in False Bay. And because that 13 and a half is halfway between the, the range at the bottom of the hypothermia table, I've adjusted the death zone down to five hours, which means that on the right hand side, somewhere between two and four hours, you will lose your big muscle controllability and consequently you will drown even if hypothermia doesn't claim you. Reading from the middle paragraph, people with hypothermia usually aren't aware of their condition. The symptoms often begin gradually. Also, the confused thinking associated with hypothermia prevents self-awareness. The confused thinking also can lead to risk-taking behavior. The most extreme example of such confused behavior is that of paradoxical undressing. There have been a number of reported instances of hypothermia vic victims who have been found undressed, which means that at some point during stage two of hypothermia, when they are still conscious, they have taken off all of their clothes, completely oblivious to the danger that they're in. The next ingredient is that of cell phone reception in False Bay which for the most part is an unknown entity. We know from experience that the green zone is reliable. Actually, it's more accurate to portray that green zone with a healthy spread of red dots in it because of two other types of failure. The, one, the first of which occurred in the most recent rescue a couple of days ago where the rescue paddler, even though he had safe tracks activated and was able to place three emergency calls, the NSRI was unable to locate him and follow him. The second type of failure is due to the extreme conditions and or human error, and that is that under extreme conditions, it is extraordinarily difficult to access, read one's phone, unlock it, and place an emergency call. And I've had a number of reported instances where people have failed to make calls for those reasons. And in fact, in my rescue of two and a half years ago, I was unable to get my touchscreen to respond to my finger through the waterproof pouch as a result probably of early onset hypothermia. Whereas the red zone opposite Smitswinkel is not. When I was rescued two and a half years ago by the NSRI, um, we were picked up three and a half kilometers offshore, and whilst we had safe tracks activated, they were unable to follow us. Whilst we were able to briefly log an emergency call before it dropped, because it was bouncing off only one cell phone tower, they were unable to triangulate, and as far as they were concerned, we might as well have been in Pofada or Kakamas. Rob Mousley has twice done east to west crossings of False Bay, and in the one instance, his wife was able to track him for the full duration, whilst in the other, he disappeared for a full 10 kilometers. We'll now examine the circumstances of the two fatalities, as well as the context in which the rest two rescues took place. So the first fatality occurred here, just off, just off our western seaboard of Cape Town, where the paddler in question went for his regular afternoon paddle along the coastline, and was clearly totally surprised by a very strong southeasterly that came up and blew him out to sea. Now, his body wasn't recovered until the next morning, still attached to his surf ski, no cell phone, no cold weather gear in place. Uh, and the water temperature that morning in nearby Bantry Bay was eight and a half degrees, which would mean that his death zone would have been between one and three hours. The second fatality in Lake Michigan in North America occurred under highly unusual circumstances in that there was an organized downwind race and the paddler in question was in fact being monitored by the race organizers as they noted that he was in difficulty and repeatedly remounting. And it was only when he stopped remounting that the rescue was called in, but by the time they got to him his body was already lifeless. The water temperature there was estimated to be maximum 10 degrees, which means too that the death zone would have been between one and three hours. This Lake Michigan incident is a frightening wake-up call to me about the speed with which hypothermia can kill you. Whilst we don't know all the specifics, we know sufficient to safely conclude that it's much more likely that this paddler died closer to the one hour than the three hour range as indicated by the death zone on the hypothermia table. We now review the key relevant facts from the three most recent NSRI rescues in False Bay. 
Incident number one occurred on the 10th of July, caused by broken steering lines of a double. The rear paddler was in the water without any cold gear for nearly 75 minutes. He was well into stage one of hypothermia at the point of rescue, and the disabling effect of the cold was such that he was completely unable to lift himself out of the water onto the rescue craft. My deduction, in fact, is that this individual has a particular physiology that gives him a very high resistance to cold, so he would be positioned towards the upper limit of the sixth hour death zone on the hypothermia table. I believe that most of the rest of us would have been at the point of transitioning between stage one and stage two of hypothermia. The second incident occurred on the 1st of August and was due to ski instability compounded by a very northerly wind that was causing swells to break over our bows from left to right. Due to the cold and the conditions, the paddler had trouble operating his phone and accordingly he fired off a, a flare but was subsequently able to make an emergency call. He was wearing one millimeter neoprene top and bottom and of course this loses a lot of its insulation properties once you are out of the water and exposed to the wind. He estimates that he fell off approximately six times and was in and out of the water for probably 20 minutes before calling for help. He was still shivering one hour after having been rescued and after having had a hot shower and a hot drink. The third incident occurred a couple of days ago on the 26th of August and was attributable to a broken paddle. The paddler was warmly dressed in neoprene and a windproof jacket and had no hypothermia issues. While safe tracks had been activated and he was able to make an emergency call, the NSRI was not able to track him. He accordingly activated his personal locator beacon. We'll talk about this at the end of the, uh, of the video. His, additionally, his paddling buddy, he was 50 to 100 meters ahead of him and could see that he was in trouble. And he too had his safe tracks activated. He attempted to make an emergency call, but due to phone access issues and the hectic conditions, was just not able to do so. So where does this leave us in terms of decisions and impact? Well, I think it leaves all of us with two questions. Number one, are you happy to rely exclusively on safe tracks and your phone? And number two, have you got the right and appropriate cold weather gear? Can you survive in the water if need be for a few hours in the event that your rescue is protracted? As far as communication backup is concerned, I'm currently using this, the Rescue Me personal locator beacon. I've covered the functionality of this in, in a separate video. Please look, for, uh, look at the link below. But in summary, this is the same device that is used currently by the shipping and maritime industry. It works on the intergovernmental um, satellite network. It requires no subscription. Uh, Richard Kohler, for instance, used this as backup for his radio in his transatlantic crossing. Um, and it works. It was used in the most recent rescue and it worked. Um, it's, it's very small, easy to put onto your life jacket, no dexterity issues, you don't be able to read it, no subscription, um, but of course you cannot communicate uh, with your rescuers. Uh, consequently, my group of, of paddlers is actually looking at getting a, a set of radios so that we can in fact communicate with each other and with the NSRI if need be. Cold weather gear. Currently, my preference is to use two 1mm neoprene layers. I use the 1mm vest underneath and the long sleeve uh, as an outer layer. But I am going to be reviewing that by looking at two additional options. The one option is to use one of those two layers underneath and then have a windproof jacket. Uh, and then my third option will be to look at maintaining my two 1mm layers and stowing on my ski a large windbreaker that I can actually put on in the event of an emergency over the top of my life jacket. Whatever your choices are in respect of both of these issues, please do stay safe on the water and please remember to keep your contributions to the NSRI. Top them up and keep them current. Thank you. This is a teaser for an upcoming father-son video that is in the works on the topic of courage and fear. Um, I mentioned my skydiving experience and those five deaths that I'd uh, encountered. Um, I'll be using my skydiving experience as kind of an adventure backdrop for exploring courage and fear. Uh, in addition to those five deaths, I also experienced uh, three uh, equipment malfunctions, um, so para parachute malfunctions. None of those was normal, and in fact, the last two occurred on the same skydive, so I am in fact one of the members of a very small club of um, 
the survivors of a double parachute malfunction. But that's just a backdrop. I mean, the issue is to explore courage and fear in our lives. Um, and there's something unique about courage in that amongst the seven classical virtues, uh, courage is described as fortitude. There's something unique about it, which we will explore in that video. But physical courage is the least important of what we should be teaching our, our sons. So we'll be exploring social or identity courage, moral courage, emotional courage, intellectual courage, and spiritual courage. So keep a lookout for that video. Um, I've still got quite a lot of research to do on it, so I estimate that I'll probably have it posted within about a month or so. Look forward to seeing you back on the channel. Thanks for watching. Cheers.